So let's start with the title of your book, Generative Scribing. What is scribing and what is generative scribing? Knowing that many are already familiar with your work, but then there are also many more people joining this call who may be less familiar. So um, uh, what is scribing? What is generative scribing? Okay, so first I just want to say hello to everybody. I've scrolled quickly across the gallery view and there are so many familiar faces and I'm holding back tears of joy, just thankful for everyone who's joining now and grateful to meet uh, new people too. So um, I was thinking about this earlier, how to make it as, as easy to describe as possible. And so I would say that scribing is drawing while people talk so that they can see what they're talking about. And I think it's this kind of movement where one person speaking, I'm at a wall drawing, and there's this kind of relationship going on. And the context is within a room and the picture is on a wall. And generative scribing, I think, is more of this kind of movement where the person who's drawing is trying to access some sort of energy that's in the space and bring that forward into the drawing. So it's a combination of this sort of movement going on in the room, like a horizontal movement, and then also a kind of vertical movement where the person drawing is accessing something inside themselves and kind of from an energy field that comes up into the horizontal movement. So that's as simple as I've gotten it so far, but it is right in the first page of the introduction too, if you need more explanation. I love that. I also love the, uh, the, the embodiment kind of uh, and the simplicity of you, um, how you bring in this other dimension, the vertical dimension. So I wonder, Kelvi, I know we'll get, you know, with many of the other questions, a lot more into the details and how to actually do that. And what really does it mean to go vertically, kind of connecting to the deeper sources of knowing? Now, but um, maybe let's start with a little bit from your personal background. So when, when you go back to your own journey, I mean, when was it that you first became aware of this vertical dimension? And is that something that happened like late in your life or could you find some sources more early in your youth, in your childhood? I don't know. So why don't you share a little bit about, you know, your personal context, your personal story that brought you into this line of work? Yeah, so I grew up in the Hudson Valley which is in New York, and the houses that I grew up in, they faced the woods, and so I always had a huge, I basically slept in both my mom's house and my dad's house, I slept waking up facing the woods in both of them, so that was a continuity, and so I went to sleep and woke up with trees, and also lots of opportunity to go out into the woods, and I didn't realize it at the time, I probably couldn't have because I was too young and unaware, but now I realize how much of a foundation those woods and nature gave me in my practice. And so, and I've been talking with my brother also recently, and we both had um, times where we would just go out, and it was safe then, I guess, <laughs> at least in the United States for kids to go back in the woods by themselves, and we would just go out and wander and do nothing except just be in the presence of that. Um, the quality that the woods and, and um, you know, the, and like ponds and sort of un like nature that doesn't have paths in it would offer. So we could just go where we wanted. And um, I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and I think, you know, as I've gotten older and certainly in the past few years with a sense of increasing complexity that I feel in the world, I have found myself returning to woods and nature to try to tap back into the feeling of, I guess, just being part of something larger than, larger than me, larger than the moment. And uh, that's something that I probably always have had in my work and never named it as such until recently, that that's really like the spiritual grounding is really um, nature for me. 
In terms of my background, I went to art school. We always had arts in all of my whole family had, everybody had um, lots of things on the walls and lots of little artifacts, like little, you know, I grew up with like little beads from, that were dug up somewhere. And so living with things that were handmade was a big part of my past as well. And the, um, the, the quality of uh, life that handmade things brings forward I think is also a big part of my practice. So, so when I draw, I think of the drawing as some sort of artifact that holds meaning for the culture. So it's not just a drawing on a wall, it's something that actually carries forward some sort of meaning or sense for another time, for the current time and for another time. So Kelvi, when you left high school or when you kind of finished college, did you have any idea what you would end up doing? Kind of? No. I mean, come on. I mean, does anybody, maybe doctors or lawyers do, but I mean, I was studying art. And so um, I loved art in high school and, you know, always. And I grew up in the 70s in the United States. So we, we had a lot of craft going on and we were always making things. And then I went and I studied painting and I didn't even know about scribing then. And um, it really started in the 70s out in the Bay Area. So I, so I, uh, and I came into it in the 90s, in the early 1990s. And I had no idea that I'd be doing this. And so when I painted, I was really aware of the value of reflection so that the object could generate, uh, could induce reflection. And then I think after school, I traveled a bit. I had grand plans of going back and getting a master's. I had a whole plan for my life, but then, you know, life took its course, <laughs> like me. And um, basically I fell in love, right? <laughs> and, so, like, and then it, it, it was a curvier path. And, um, and then I met up with people who were, who were bringing in scribing as one facilitative capacity in uh, collaborative uh, design sessions. And so that's really how I was introduced to it. And then the, my, my interest in working in this area of reflection continued on that other path. Yeah. So, so that's now in the 1990s, right? And that was here yeah. in, in the Boston area, the collaborative design? Yeah, it started, um, yeah, it ended up that I, it, that is part of what brought me to the Boston area. And then I was more involved um, through that work, I met um, Bill Isaacs and Beth Janderno, who's on the call, and learned more about dialogue and um, really the power of collective intelligence and how people could think together and be together in a space and have some, some, some sort of, um, you know, emergence, emergence isn't the right word, but like something comes through people together that couldn't really come through one person alone. And so working with Dialogos and that group of people, which is how I met you, Otto, um, really opened up the possibility of what art could do in a social context. So not just one person drawing and then one person having a painting on their wall, which is somewhat what I grew up with, but what would happen if you created something in a space of people in a social field and then the artifact or the drawing directly informed that social field. So you were creating something for people that was of their content and it was, um, there was a loop. That's where like the, the loop between what I'm making and what somebody else is experiencing became even stronger. Um, yeah. And then I think with the presencing work, which has been about the past 10 or so years, I, that deepened. So that helped me get more in touch with my own authentic voice. So I wasn't trying to draw like other people anymore or work in a profession in the same way as other people, but I realized that I could, I, I could bring something forward that would be unique only because it was coming through me. Like we all have that possibility. So um, the presencing work really opened that aperture for me of, you know, what is, what is meant for my hand to draw? What line is unique from me that may or may not fit in, it, it may or may not make sense, but it's, 
it's like tapping into that, my own personal source, in addition to the source that comes from the social field for me and also the source from nature. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I have like, a, maybe like a, a reflection or a comment in, in another question. So, so the, the comment is um, that I think it's really, uh, and it, it both relate to really social art and what do you mean by that? And I think it's really remarkable um, when you read the book, um, how you draw together the work of Bill Isaacs, David Cantor, Peter Senge, the presencing work and, and other lines of work really all, and it's all based on your collaboration with these lines of work. And, and I think that's just so wonderful kind of to see that integrated. And it's, it's really kind of that's in itself already is a contribution. And um, then the social art, um, so what really do you, so that's really also the subtitle of the book, really, what, what, what is, and, and it strikes me in what you just shared, what happened in the 90s. So you didn't become a specialized artist kind of doing art for art, but you know, it was always embedded in facilitation and kind of social development, mental situations uh, as an instrument kind of for making social structures, social fields, social evolve. So I, I want to, uh, you know, I would like to come back to your opening remark, uh, really, when you said it, it, it has this horizontal, right? Mm -hmm. And then also the vertical. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really what, you know, me as a partner and also as a client of yours, kind of what, what, made, what makes me, having seen also many other scribes and, you know, great uh, colleagues working, what's special about your work is really how you it's the vertical dimension right kind of to essentialize to really do more with less and what really is that process i know many people have asked that also mm. but what what was it i mean when you say vertical what do you really mean and what is what is it that you do that allows you to um to operate that way that's a question that many of us have in the circle because it's a question that's not only relevant for scribes, but for each of us who is uh, engaging in this new social art form that's so necessary today. Yeah, it's, um, I have to note too that in the horizontal, I spoke to it as if it were contained in the room, but my, my, the more expansive horizontal practice comes from Beth who's on this call, <laughs> and I might get like teary, but because I learned from her about opening the heart. And so um, one of the first things I do when I'm scribing is open my heart to the room and open my heart to the people in the room and open my heart to the people that I can imagine not in the room who are supporting what's happening there. So we can say that's the system, we can say it's someone's family structure, but that's the first opening that enables me to just show up at all because I get way too nervous before I draw. So I have to get out of my head and quickly go here. I remember Beth's lesson and I just try to expand like that. Then the vertical is, um, you know, I have to mention Arawana Hayashi, who her mindfulness practices um, that come from the Shambhala tradition are connecting to earth and connecting to sky, which we often do in our sessions. And I quickly, you know, I think of that connection, but then there's something else that happens in me, which is um, on good days, you know, this doesn't happen all the time, but when um, there's almost a dissolving that happens where I dissolve. It's not about me at the wall. It's not about the people in the room. It's purely about what wants to happen in this moment in time. So I'm listening, like I'm listening to the data and I'm listening to the facts coming out and I'm making sense of the patterns and I'm like, that's all sort of going on up here, but then like what's going on here, you know, this whole part is where this is what I've learned. Like 
to cultivate, which is just slowing down, not getting caught up in the busyness of the head and the sort of mind chatter, but like slowing down to let this part of me just be. Like when I was out in nature, you know, when I was a little kid, like sitting on a rock or sitting on a, a piece of moss, there was no sense of time. You know, there was no, there was no sense of rules or order or what I was supposed to do or what I wasn't supposed to do. I could look around and pick up a twig and make a little sculpture with a leaf. And there was a spirit of like curiosity and freedom that opened up. And that's what somehow I try to connect back into when I'm drawing is like that sense of wonder or that sense of timelessness that um, the world offers us, but we're sometimes so busy that we just, most of the time we're so busy that we're not even, um, I should speak for myself, <laughs> they're probably much more, uh, I should speak for myself, but usually I'm so busy that I'm not tuned into that, the potential of the moment. So some of it is just really slowing down so that I can sense into the potential of the moment and try to create some space for that to come into the room and into the drawing. So what, what, what I heard you saying is, um... You started with um, Beth, with opening your heart, with really connecting with everything in the room, outside the room. And then you referenced Arana of kind of, I heard that as a staying with that and also attending kind of what is uh, emerging from that deeper space. And then Basically, the, the image as you were speaking that formed in my mind is kind of when you draw, you said kind of you, yourself and the, these better moments, kind of yourself is dissolving. So your hand is writing, your hand is drawing, but it's not drawing, it's like a drawing from the collective, right? You draw what, the co what wants to emerge from the collective and the connection to the collective is happening through your heart. Yeah. Right? So that's kind of how you just described the, um, the, the vertical opening, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's really profound because that is a universal process, right? So that you embody like kind of an amazing living archetype, but that is so relevant in so many professions and um, aspects of life. Mm -hmm. uh, today so before we use maybe this kind of golden nugget that you just shared with us maybe as a jump off point for a little check-in so where we you know can maybe look at our own life experience through the through the lens of what you just shared described um, uh, to us I, I want to ask you is there anything else that you want to leave us with before we move into the um maybe 10 minute um, group check-in and then uh, from there uh, into the Q&A. So any, any other comments from your side? Yeah, the only thing is um, I want to really emphasize that this is not something that is, I don't think you need to be that like spiritually awakened or, you know, like master, expert, whatever to access this. I think it's something that everyone has the capacity to open up to. Um, you know, I think I'm trying to name it for this field of practice that I'm in because I find it really valuable and that the times really call for a sort of opening, uh, you know, in ourselves so that we can facilitate ourselves into another way of being. Um, but so I'm trying to name something and give voice to something that I've experienced, but I really think that it's a potential that we we all have in some way and that the, the potential is just opening up to like what we're meant to bring forward, you know, like our place on the, on the ground. Um, so anyway, I just don't, I just want to say it's for everybody to discover or in their own way. Yeah, that's about it. 
All right. So. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvi. And, you know, maybe just um, we, um, uh, when uh, uh, we both kind of discussed how to do this launch event, kind of we, de we decided um, um, uh, also based on Kelvi's input to have this little check in because uh, as uh, Kelvi just said, it's not really just one person, but, you know, her intention is with the book to really also create a community and to allow kind of that community to connect with each other. That's why we thought kind of a 10 minute sequence of a little uh, check in conversation might, might be helpful for each of us to touch base with our own experience. And then you will be in a breakout room with together with three uh, other members of this call and of this event. And uh, you just go around and every person takes a minute or two to share your own thoughts um, around these uh, two questions. So first you start with introducing yourself. Um, then uh, maybe share a little bit what draws you kind of uh, to this book event. And then lastly, kind of from either reading in the book or just listening to Kelvi, what she shared with us, what was it that, you know, is connecting most with you? So can be based on what you read in the book, can be based on what uh, Kelvi just shared with us, the horizontal opening, the vertical opening, where we feel with others kind of this deeper Connection, for example, how does that show up in your life? Um, so each person, a minute or two, if you have a little bit more time, you can move into a conversation after everyone has spoken. And then after 10, 8 to 10 minutes, we'll bring you back into this large room. We'll move into the Q&A. Enjoy the process. At this point, probably um, most people are back into the um, main room. Uh, we are now moving into the second, uh, the, the third part um, uh, of um, our structure here, which is the open dialogue Q&A. Um, you see on your bottom menu um, the chat function. So if you have a specific question, uh, please input your question into that uh, chat um, room. And then from there, we'll then select questions and call on you when your question is selected to share that uh, with the rest of us. So how is that? that's how that's going to work. Use the chat room for inputting your question, and then we'll uh, call on you when it's selected. Um, before we you know, uh, come to these questions, Calvi, we had like 100 questions already, and many of them, so roughly like 20%, were about the process. How do you actually do this? So, so what's the process you actually use? You, you talked a little bit about it to us already in terms of the inner principles with the vertical deepening and the horizontal connection. But what else can you share with us that helps us to actually um, um, embody this quality of work ourselves? Yeah, so I'll say, um, I'll try to say quickly that the main process I used, which is in the book, I'll just hold up this card, I don't know if you can see it, is um, there's sort of these different capacities of perceiving, knowing, I can't see myself, so I don't know if this is working, perceiving, knowing, joining, being, and drawing. So there are those five capacities, and that's basically the framing of the whole book. So I do go into a lot more detail about some of these process pieces in, in the book itself. Um, but I, there are probably two main components of my practice. One is around listening, like deep listening. And then the other is probably around, um, um, well, probably coherence, I'd say. Like just finding how things fit together and framing things in a way that they um, have some order and sense to them. But I don't want to talk too much about that because it, it, I do go into more detail in the book and those are questions that I think are a little more tangible to answer, but um, I want to hear from other people. All right. So, <laughs> so a, a, lot, a, a lot can be found in terms of these questions uh, in the book. And um, so as we now move into the questions that come up right now from the discussion groups, I want to introduce my two colleagues who are co-facilitating this session with um, um, with me, um, uh, that's uh, Judy from Brussels and Angela from Berlin. Judy, um, um, you wanna um, take it over for the next question? Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, so I'm Julie based in Belgium and um, had the honor to see some of this 
book emerge while I uh, was co-working with um, Kelvi. We had a very interesting question also coming from a special person because we are joined by someone who put her alarm at 3 a.m. in the morning in order to be here. Heather from Australia, would you love to share your question that you had about listening? Maybe you can unmute yourself and then share the question. Uh, ask the question to Kelvi. Oh, hello. I, <laughs> I don't really want to show you in my bed here, so we'll just move that back there. <laughs> hello, Kelvi and Julie and Otto and Simone and Angela. Um, well, it's wonderful to be here. And yes, so my um, question was um, this listening, but I think you've described it a little as you were speaking before, Kelvi. I'm... I'm really interested um, in um, these levels of listening. I always, um, when I'm watching in the live sessions, I'm imagining um, you're listening with Otto speaking, you hear Adam speaking, you hear these questions coming from the field. And as you said, you know, um, you're holding this in, in you on these um, way beyond this first level of, oh, somebody said that, oh, somebody said that, but there's some deeper connection. So yeah. that's what I'm wondering about. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, thanks for um, waking up to join us too. <laughs> um, so I will speak to this because there were a lot of questions around um, listening in general and um, I find it one of the one of the hardest things to do because if I'm listening, I'm always listening for the content, and I'm also listening for how pieces of the content relate and hold together, and um, and then I'm also trying to listen for what wants to come into the room that's not yet known. The more generative listening, and let that inform my scribing and. Something that I've been really trying to practice that I find challenging is, is attending to all the different levels of listening at once. So um, if there have been times when nobody would know it because my back is to the group, but I'm so caught up in a feeling of something, I'm like, ah, oh, like what, what is that, you know, what's trying to happen there? Or like I hear something outside or it starts raining and I can get lost easily in that sensory sort of listening. And then I completely miss what Otto is saying or what someone else is saying. And I think I disguise it very well because I might be drawing while I'm doing it. So people think I'm listening to what the words are, but it's very hard. Um, so I think, you know, it's just an ongoing practice. And sometimes to note, you know, I'm very fortunate to, to work in, in settings where there is generative listening going on or deeper listening, but I also do, lots of sessions in places where it's pure content. It's, you know, 90 minutes, four 90 minute sessions a day of direct download of, um, you know, of a, for, from a professor or at a conference where it's just trying to keep up with the, um, you know, what people are saying so that no, it doesn't always, the deeper listening doesn't always come in when I'm just trying to pay attention and make sense of things that are coming in very, very quickly. So it's really like toggling and going, going back and forth between the different levels and, um, and then um, knowing what's appropriate where. So, you know, it's like I, I wouldn't show up. I wrote, I don't know, I said this somewhere, like I wouldn't show up um, for a picnic in the summer wearing a winter jacket. And that's kind of like, you know, I have to have a certain sense of what, what quality listening I want to try to focus on when I'm showing up for a certain session. So, I don't know, I could go on a long time and I, and I want to make sure there, we have some other questions too. Yes. So I hope yes. that's a start, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Calvi. Before we um, uh, move to the next question, I, stay, I want to stay a, lot, a little moment uh, more on the listening and come back to uh, your teacher, Calvi, that you mentioned, uh, where the, the maybe one of the most important foundations for the new art form 
that your book is about really where you learned it. And that's um, Beth, Beth Jenner Noah. So yeah. she's on the call. And um, I, I just wonder whether, uh, I know it's unfair, there was no warning, but I, I just wonder because Beth really has been um, the main teacher kind of for uh, establishing that connection. I, I have worked with many co-facilitators and, you know, and I was always kind of um, surprised kind of Beth is standing in front of a group and kind of immediately there is kind of this connection there. And like regular people like me, I have to work like for a week, right? And maybe at the end of the week, I have a little connection to the group. Beth, right, goes there, boom, there's the connection. So Beth, how have you been doing that? What is it kind of what, what you taught Calvi that, that uh, maybe, um, maybe you could share uh, a few words with us? <laughs> well, it's a joy to see you all and um, to be a part of this. Thank you. Um, and I was surprised, Kelby, and I um, appreciate the acknowledgement. But I think, kind of like as you have said, Kelby, it's something we all have. Um, and I maybe it's because of my Irishness. I don't really know. But I had the, somehow, when I was very young, I just got that opening my heart that... Uh, somehow that love was what was wanting to come through always. <laughs> and that if I could really open my heart to the love that was always present, that somehow I could hold the room. I could hold whatever was there, whether it was anger or attention or whatever. And if I could physically, um, Kelvy, I saw you open your arms and um and that's what we've talked about i remember talking about this uh, with you and and it, there is this thing about physically opening my arms and opening my heart and opening my whole being i would do that before i would start in a room i would just do that and if i couldn't do it in a way that's you know might um be a location where i didn't i couldn't do it i just did it inside myself just imagine myself opening my arms my heart my and for to be a channel to be a, a vessel i saw someone right on here um so i would say that and i also would say that Otto, i think you do it all the time and it doesn't take you long it's like right there <laughs> <laughs> that's what i have to say uh, thank you <laughs> thanks beth yeah. Thank you, Beth. It makes me think of something that um, another like really small trick I have when I'm scribing to try to connect into this capacity of the heart is um, if I'm feeling closed in some way, all I need to do is find someone in the room, someone in the audience, even if it's a thousand people and look them in the eye and like really try to see someone in the eye and have them see me in my eye. And that just does it right away. So it's like a little, um, <laughs> you know, like a little, a little quick uh, heart breath or something to uh, have an, have like an eye to eye connection connection with somebody that then opens that capacity for me. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Wow, we saw a couple of other questions. And it's an interesting conversation. It reminds me as well about to what Juana taught me once. When I go and stand in front of a group, she always tells me, Julie, you don't need to like them, just love them. And it really works. It really works. Anyway, there was a good question from Mike, Mike Coleman. Uh, do you, would you like to unmute yourself and bring your question in? Mark, are you still with us? I think there are a number of marks, so Julie, which? It's Coleman, it's you. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Mark. I am, I'm flattered that I get to ask a question. Good to see you all. I'm very pleased to be on this call and uh, learn a little bit more. So, Kelvin, my question is, about how you manifest something that's so internal. Most of us are used to talking and bringing things out, and that's our way of communicating. 
uh, but you're doing it through something visually, and so I'm curious how you um, how you manifest that, how you bring that out. Uh, from something so inside yourself into something that you share yeah. that actually persists that lasts as visual image. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I sometimes think, um, and I, a lot of other scribes probably can relate to this, is, is I make sense through seeing things or through having things expressed outside of myself. So if I can't see something, it's completely cluttered inside and so um, I think from a very very early age I was externalizing what was going on inside of me so that I could relate to it and and make sense and so for me it's very natural to do that because of how my brain works um, or it's a coping strategy for my brain um, and I don't have any insights about I would have to think more about that actually to um, think about how that actually works but it's if I don't draw something out, I I really can't. I don't know how to relate. It's hard to make sense of. So even now, speaking it is different. If I could draw, if, if I could start like drawing out my answer, I would have a probably a different answer. I'll have to think about that some more. Yeah. Thanks, though. Thank you, um, Kelvi. The next question goes to Agi uh, Kalungubanda. Mm. Thank you and congratulations again, Kelvi. My question is, uh, do you ever experience moments when you are, you are unable to bring what is really wanting to come through you? And if you do experience that, how do you handle it? Because uh, I'm just thinking at times that you want, to, you would want to say something and you know you want to say it, but you don't feel like you, you can say it. I'm, I'm wondering whether that does Oh, I mean, happen to you when, yeah. yeah. So how do you do, deal with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with suspension, like an ability to suspend. So I'm pretty much feeling things all the time, like whether I'm scribing or not, that's just how I'm wired. And, um, and there's some choice making around what is appropriate to the situation to bring forward and, and, maybe what's more appropriate to sit with. And um, I think I'm still learning about that. <laughs> but uh, in drawing, at least, there are times where um, uh, I would really feel something strongly or pick up on something or there's, um, say, some anger. An example would be somebody in the room is really angry and, um, or really frustrated and maybe they're going on a rant or they're talking about something. And I have a choice, like, do I recognize that and include it? Is that, does that fit with the whole? Or is that like, going back to nature, is that like um, you know, a flash thunderstorm that comes in five minutes, you have like a flash of rain and all of a sudden everything's wet. And then in five minutes it's gone and the sun comes back out. So do you include the rain or do you focus on the sunny day? And, um, it's just a moment to, I have no specific answer, but it's a moment to moment choice around what is the larger picture that wants to be revealed and do the moments of, is it a sunny picture that's wanting to be revealed overall or is the rain relevant to the sunny picture and then making choices around to include it. Does that make sense? It's just moment to moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe we have one more question, um, one or two more questions. Uh, Julie or Angela, have you seen anything else? Yeah, we have found um, two more questions and maybe th th we can bring those in. One question is one that I you asked uh, you, myself, and I see many other people. So um, it's Susan Fox, but there's others who are referring to it as well. It's like, is this only for people who can really draw well, or who identify with them, themselves with being an artist? Or That's another great question. And there were a lot of people who asked that um, it, through the RSVPs. Um, so I would say, you know, it's a balance. Like, there is a capacity of the hand to be able to express something. But I really 
believe that that is something that everybody can do. I really believe that everybody can express something through the hand if they just practice or they just let themselves believe that they can. And that most of the work is underneath. You know, the hand is like, is like this, right? And then there's like all this other, all so much else of us that goes into what wants to come through just through the hand and like through a marker or through a brush. And so it's those capacities that we all have. And then this capacity is one that can be developed. Um, and there are lots of tools out there. I can share back some resources for basic drawing, um, you know, some books and things. Um, but I think most of it is developing like the capacity to listen and make sense and have the courage really to let something come through you and not get stuck by the mind saying it won't look like, you know, I have this all the time. I can't really draw an elephant. So why should I try? But then I won't draw anything. So like you have to get out of we have to figure out how to get out of the way so that we can just express and, and like show up a little bit more um, to help something be seen. Um, yeah. It's, it's much more valuable to have something be seen than to have it be a beautiful elephant. So <laughs> like, just go for it. <laughs> Maybe, uh, uh, Kelvi, before we come to your closing comments, uh, here's a question from Yanis. Mm -hmm. um, that really brings us back to where we open, which is the horizontal and the vertical connection. So, Yanis, uh, the question around timelessness and being present, can you um, quickly um, share that with, uh, with us? Yes, thank you, Otto. Uh, I'm really thrilled and I have goosebumps participating in this beautiful discussion. So, Kelby, my, my question is, you mentioned that you, um, you, you feel the timelessness, the timelessness uh, which the world is offering, and for me, I know that time, timelessness is connected to the flow. And I was wondering if you're really getting into a flow state as you really draw. And your drawings, the way I see them, it reminds me of a, of, of, of a stream, of a river. So it's very liquid. At the same time, I know that flow goes with isolation, being in a trance. And I was wondering if this is happening, how can you manage to balance the presence, being present, and at the same time being in a flow where the time is not existing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's also a great question. And um, as you were saying it, I realized there are moments of flow, but I wouldn't say I ever get lost in it for even like five minutes because it's, or maybe there's a flow, maybe there are multiple flows. So maybe there's a flow of my hand with the ink and the, and the surface, you know, so that's one flow that's very intimate. And then there's a flow of, that I can experience with the person speaking or the group speaking. So if it's a dialogue, sometimes I'll like literally be about to write a word. And I'm sure other scribes have had this experience where I'm about to write something and then somebody says the word, <laughs> you know, like, so there's that kind of flow also, but those are moments. And, um, and I, I think part of, part of the, the generative, you know, the, the practice of generative scribing is staying open so that those moments can come in, um, you know, like, uh, like, like light catching a, a petal or something like, you know, light catching a leaf, like it, it isn't, um, you don't always see light through a leaf, but once in a while, like the leaf turns and then all of a sudden light, you know, there's like light. And I think that's the, that's my experience of flow where it's like that. Sometimes it's like that. And sometimes it's, you know, more visible or more present. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I think, Kel, we, we come towards the end of our hour here. And I think well, a question that's uh, uh, certainly on many people's mind now is, okay, how, wh where can I take this from here? If I want to engage with this more, what are the pathways other than maybe, uh, you know, through the book itself? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and maybe also how could I contribute kind of for this field, kind of this, um, what you're describing uh, in the book and in this call uh, and this session? with us if I want to you know, engage and help this kind of uh, new emerging body of practice to come more into the world, what is it that I can do to help? Yeah, um, well, there's some practical things like um, 
we'll have a follow-up email with some more information. So we'll have this recording and, um, you know, maybe I can answer some of the questions that we haven't addressed. No promises, but I can look through them and see if something is, you know, what comes up for that. Um, we have programs for capacity buildings. So those are, those were in the mailing that you received and those are online and we can send more information if you're interested in, if someone's interested in really going to a workshop. Um, and then, but the main thing I think is um, staying in community. You know, there are a lot of people on this call I noticed who have been in some of the workshops that we've had in the past year and I know they're staying in touch through social media and other formats and trying to meet each other in person and staying in community and sharing experiences um, between people you know and also across regions, I think, will be really important to develop this. There's some amazing work going on in China and Asia now, and we have some people, Jace and Ripley and Xuan are on the call and they didn't get their voices in, but they're also up at I think one in the morning, so <laughs> hello to them. Um, and there's, they're doing some beautiful work in Asia and in Europe, people have been developing um, very professionally and in the US, people have been doing this a long time and are trying to ask what's coming, what's next. And so I think together um, we can start exploring what the field, you know, what the possibility is for the practice and how this is an art form, not just how this shows up in the room today or in this one event or, you know, not just how people experience it in, in a workshop, but how do we connect across our experiences to deepen the practice and, um, and further understand the, what social art can be really in this century. What does social art have to offer our species um, as we're trying to understand ourselves and wake up? That's it. <laughs> I guess I'm Kelvin, Kelvin on, on the practical side, kind of the, yeah. there is, we taped this session, right? Yeah. So that, that would be available. Uh, then um, uh, I think uh, for those who actually did read the book, uh, an Amazon review wouldn't hurt probably. And then um, also um, you intend to do another session like this, right? In a, in, a, in, in a few months from now. So you would like to say something about that? Yeah, there are some people on the call who are already uh, signed up for an advanced program that will run in Hamburg um, at the, uh, in May. And they don't know it yet, but I think we'll try to have some sort of community conversation that maybe we make more available uh, to, a broader, to a broader group there because we'll really be going deeper into generative scribing as, um, as a group of advanced practitioners. So to be, to be dis discovered and figured out, but that, that would come sort of mid-May, so yeah. So I also wanna thank you, Otto, for hosting this conversation and initiating really the, the call and being such a huge and strong and solid supporter of this art form. Um, I don't think it would exist without your, um, your gentle nudging and your, your loving uh, um, holding for it. So thank you on, from me and from all of the scribes out, you know, all of the thousands of scribes who are trying to deepen and expand what we do, a, a big thanks to you as well. well we didn't have that scripted, but. <laughs> as you're noticing, and you know, uh, my uh, gratitude goes out to the entire rest of the PI team also holding this, co-creating the book uh, with Kelvi and um, also, um, you know, uh, Kelvi, to, to you personally, I think you know, going through the book, particularly when you go through all the uh, pages, kind of the, the, the great pictures, uh, examples, drawings in, in the end, you see all the key events. It's, it's like, a, you know, also an evolution of the Presencing Institute community. <laughs> and you see which would have never unfolded the way kind of if, if it weren't kind of for, for your uh, social art, Kelvi, of uh, really making that available and visible so it's it's really um um uh it's a wonderful gift of life um that we are collaborating on in, in this uh, larger field with so many 
good colleagues and friends and thanks to everyone. Yeah. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to everyone for showing up and anyone who will watch the recording and anyone interested in the topic and in helping people see. <laughs>